Thank you, Carrie. JW has been a gardener since birth and a master gardener since 2009. He has an extensive background in horticulture, specifically native plants, herbs, vegetables, and especially American chestnut trees. He has a keen interest in container gardening and the methods used in obtaining the best results. JW also has a passion for continuing education related to gardening, both in acquiring knowledge and sharing that knowledge with others. So over to you, JW. Thank you, Christine, and hello, everybody. Um, this is basically a container gardening 101. It's the basics. It's just to give you an idea of specific things about container gardening. And again, if you have any ideas for how we can uh, give you another class that goes to specifics about anything presented in this, please let me know or uh, fill that out on your evaluation form. So container gardening. Today, we're gonna to cover the basics of container planting. Why are you using a container? what type of container, as in what are you going to use for the container. We're going to discuss drainage, soil, location of container, method of planting, watering, shade and sun, and types of plants. Why containers? Why are you choosing containers? Do you have limited space? Um, like me, I actually used to be a real estate agent and I used to use container plants to cover uh, dings in houses. <laughs> and I actually have a container out front of my house that uh, when they delivered wood, they nicked the, it's called the water table, the color part between the siding and the, the ground. And uh, I have a container right in front of that. So uh, less maintenance, is that a true statement? Or are they more maintenance? Um, what are your reasons? Just think about them. So the first thing we're going to cover is choices, choosing pots. Um, you know, you have to think of a bunch of things when you are choosing containers. Um, what are they made of? How big a container do you need? And uh, do they have drainage or do you have to provide drainage? The size of the container depends on what you're planting. Now, when you are planting the container, you have to keep in mind that your little baby plants aren't going to be little baby plants for the whole season. They're going to grow into their adult size. So when you choose the container and you put the plants in there, you have to keep in mind that you're going to need that extra space for them to grow. Also, you have to consider the more plants you're putting in, the more roots that are going to be growing into the container. The container you see in front of you is probably filled about halfway down with nothing but roots. So, <clears throat> you know, if you're using two plants, you can use a smaller container. Five plants, you need a larger container and a deeper container. Size is not just the, um, the diameter of the container, it's also the height. Uh, containers, they come in lots of different types. We have, just to name a few, clay, plastic, wood, and I put wire, but wire also means metal. Um, the benefits of using clay pots, they are aesthetically pleasing. When we think of containers, most of us immediately think of clay pots. Um, they're great for herbs. Herbs love clay pots because herbs like to have what we refer to as dry feet. You water them and then the moisture wicks away through the porous clay and the roots of the herbs stay dry. It also doesn't create a lot of humidity. Herbs don't like that, especially at night. During the day, it's fine, but at night, they don't like it. Um, having mentioned the porosity of the container, the highly porous nature causes the clay pots to dry out quickly. So in the heat of the summer, you're going to find that you're watering a lot more frequently. But you can also get a glazed ceramic, which has a glazing on the inside of the pot or on the outside of the pot. I like it when it's on the outside because it looks better. Um, and that helps to retain the moisture. Plastic containers. Plastic loses water more slowly than clay, which is a great thing if you're doing something like vegetables. 
Um, the thing is you have to be careful of not overwatering in a plastic container because that water will sit there, the moisture will sit there, and it could cause a buildup of bacteria or fungus. Um, the soil temperature in a plastic container varies less. Now, having said that, if you have a light container, it's going to stay cooler. And if you have a darker container, it's going to be warmer because it absorbs the sun's rays, but the temperature will vary less. Plastic is less work. And I say that because when you're doing cleanup, you don't have to soak the pots. You basically can clean them out with a mixture of bleach and water. Um, just for someone who's going to ask that question, it's usually anywhere between one to three parts bleach to about nine parts water. So you're basically looking at maybe a cup of bleach to a standard five gallon bucket. Okay, um, more choices and some can even look like clay with the polystyrene containers that they have out now. Uh, sometimes you don't know a difference. So I find myself a lot of times, of course I'm weird, but I find myself a lot of times going up to containers and just tapping on them to see if they are actually clay or if they are polystyrene. Um, and plastic is lightweight. If you're doing a large container, especially if you have to move that container, um, you may want it to be lightweight. Wood containers. Now the picture you see on the left is our raised beds and they are containers. As it says in the description for this workshop, everything's a container. Even if you're digging down into the soil, the soil that you're enriching and working in is going to be surrounded by a harder packed soil. So it's kind of a container and you have to keep that in mind when you're doing things. But I like to mention at this point about the raised beds, if you are using wood to make your raised beds, you want to consider that wood does rot. Cedar and redwood definitely are good if you're going for the long haul. Um, pine works very well too. I have several raised pine beds that I started when I first became a master gardener back in 2009, and they're still going strong. So we're looking at 12 years and I have a little bit of rot where the water drains out, but as long as I keep it free, it seems like it's okay. Um, whiskey barrels are great. A lot of people have been using them. Um, when you are using wood, you want to make sure it's a natural material. And when I say that, not a compressed board or a particle board, they tend to not hold up to moisture very well. Um, but the thing that you do want to watch out for is treated lumber, especially if you are growing edible food in the container. Whatever the wood is treated with is going to leach into the plant. The plant will absorb those chemicals. So you want to be careful. Um, many years ago that a lot of people used to use railroad ties and railroad ties have creosote in them to help them stand up to weathering. Creosote is a poison to humans and that would be absorbed by the plants. And when people were eating the plants, you know, your tomatoes, your peppers, your herbs, they were getting sick. And lo and behold, it's because of the creosote in the, um, in the railroad ties. So you want to make sure of that. Now, I understand that there are a lot of treatments out there. There are a lot of um, uh, things that they say are fine to use for food. Just keep in mind that if you are going to waterproof your container, that you are using something that says it's safe for human consumption and that you are actually reading the bottle and not just, you know, asking someone at the place where you're buying it. Make sure you understand what you are treating your wood with because that is going into your body if you are using it for an edible, uh, an edible plant, such as vegetables or herbs. Now, if it's ornamental, you don't really have to worry about it too, too much, but you still don't wanna be putting that into the environment. So keep that in mind. Now, why are planters? When I say wire planters, I am talking about the ones that I have shown up here, but I'm also talking about metal containers. Corrugated metal containers are coming into vogue, and a lot of people are starting to use troughs uh, and uh, the galvanized steel uh, buckets to plant plants in. 
When you're using a metal, make sure that it is a type of galvanized steel so that you don't have rust and you don't lose the container earlier than you want. When you're using wire planters, you are going to have to use some kind of a liner with it, such as the one pictured on the left with the sphagnum moss. Um, then you fill it with the potting mix and the plants. There are virtually no drainage problems with the sphagnum moss. Uh, the, I'm sorry, with the wire containers, because it goes through the sphagnum moss and you will find yourself watering extra heavy because it does not retain the moisture. Seedlings and cuttings and plants, oh my. So you've got your container, what are you gonna put into it? Um, you could do one of three things. You can do seedlings. Um, and the pros of doing seedlings um, are that they are inexpensive. Seedlings, uh, you know, a packet of seeds runs anywhere from, you know, you can get the Ferry Morse for like a buck sometimes. Uh, they run up to like $4.95, depending on what you are planting and the, the specific plant that you're using. It can be a little bit more expensive, but that's, look at it this way. Average pack of seeds is about $3.50 and an average plant, one plant is probably about anywhere from $1.99 to, gosh, you can spend 10 to $20 for a plant, depending on the size. Um, you have a peace of mind with using your seedlings because you know where the seeds come from. You know if they're, um, if they're organic or not. You know the soil used that you're planting the seeds in. You know what food or fertilizer is used. The cons over there on the left, they can be time consuming. You have to get your, your pots and or your peat moss packs and you have to get your soil, you have to get your seeds, you have to plant them and you have to nurture them. Um, that does take up space and hopefully you have the space to do it if that's the route you want to go. It is labor intensive. There's a lot of labor involved with seedlings, not only the initial, like I just pointed out, but you have to keep an eye on them. You have to monitor those seeds. They're not a sure thing, depending on where you're planting your seeds. If you're waiting until the last frost is over and you're planting them outside, you have to worry about the weather. Inside or outside, you have to worry about disease. Seedlings can get a disease called tamping off. And what happens is you have a plant that sprouts up and it's coming up and then all of a sudden it just drops. And that happens because of moisture content and the seed basically, the little plant rots out right there and just falls over. You also have to worry about seed viability and germination. Uh, germination rates for viable seeds, like if you buy a new packet, the industry says that it's approximately 85 to 95%. You are gonna have some seeds that just won't germinate. If you're using older seeds, that can drop drastically. You know, if they're a year or two old, it drops down to 70, 60, maybe even 50%. So you have to keep that in mind. Cuttings. Cuttings. You need time to propagate those cuttings. Um, depending on the plant, it can take several weeks to several months to propagate a plant. Viability. If you do your cuttings, not all of them are going to come to fruition. You're going to have some losses. They're not usually huge, but you have to keep that in mind. If you're going to definitely want four basil plants, then you should probably do anywhere from six to eight basil plants to make sure you get those four. And the extras you can trade with friends or you can trade with me. Um, viability. The viability, as I just pointed out, you are not going to always get every cutting to root. So you might lose a couple. Uh, again, space is needed for this. Um, and you have to have the room to be able to, you know, do these cuttings. And again, they're not a sure thing. They are inexpensive. If you have one basil plant and you make 10 basil plants, that works out to be pretty cheap. You have peace of mind again because you know what food or fertilizer is used to feed the plants um, and you know what soil that you're putting them in. Um, plants. So plants can be expensive. You go out and buy, you know, four tomato plants, four pepper plants, you want some lettuce, you want watermelon, you want cantaloupe. It, it adds up. Average price of plants 
is probably anywhere between 495 and 795 for one plant. So if you multiply that by, you know, some of us are crazy and do 100, you know, you're looking at a <clears throat> you're looking at a pretty expensive garden. So you want to pay attention to the costs so that your your gardening isn't bankrupting you. Um, you do not know how they've been grown. You don't know what food has been used, what fertilizer they've been fed with. Um, you don't know what soil they've been planted in. So those are things to keep in mind if you are wanting to grow, say, an organic garden, you have to make sure you buy organic plants. Um, buying plants saves time, saves a lot of time, saves space. You're basically taking them from the nursery and putting them in the garden. Um, you know exactly what you're getting. You are buying a tomato plant. You can tell it's a tomato plant. You're buying a pepper plant. You can tell it's a pepper plant. So, you know, sometimes the seeds get mixed in and you have a pepper plant growing where you thought it was supposed to be a tomato plant. So again, you know exactly what you're getting. Viable specimens, you can examine them. We'll go into that a little bit later, but you can make sure that you're getting a good plant, a good healthy plant and definitely less labor. You do not have to, you know, monitor them as far as their, their growth until you put them in the ground. So before you get them in the ground, you do not have to constantly worry about them. Um, once they're in the ground, then yes, you do have to worry about them. So plant selection, don't be like me. The top one is the advice I give all you people <laughs> in my lectures. And I'm always very good about giving you the correct information. The bottom, which I should cover up is exactly what I do at a nursery. I'm just plant happy and I'm buying everything and anything I can get my hands on. Control people, control. So before we go on, we're gonna get into selecting plants. Are there any quick questions right now for containers? Okay, so I don't see- uh, Yes, JW, okay. yes. We have one from Rick. Um, he asks, how about using the fabric grow bags that have been on the market for several years there is a new gardening book dedicated to growing in grow bags. You absolutely can use grow bags. And um, there, um, I did not know that there was a book out, out about them. They are not my thing, but again, they're a container. I didn't cover all containers. That's why I definitely give the disclaimer that I'm not covering all containers. Um, to do the gardening grow bags, you know, are you doing the ones that are on the fence? And these are rhetorical questions, but the ones that grow on the fence, are you doing the ones that are in the ground uh, and you're just putting your tomatoes or your potatoes in? They work great. They work just like any other container. So I'm not saying I don't recommend them. If that's your thing, you do it. But I'm not a huge fan of them, um, probably because I have way too many containers <laughs> as it is. And uh, yeah, but yeah, definitely use the grow bags. Any others? Okay, so we're selecting plants. The first thing you wanna think about, and this might seem contrary to what you're thinking, but you want to avoid the biggest and the tallest. The biggest and the tallest, basically, that means that they've been competing for sunlight. And because of this, they are probably going to be a lot more spindly. They're gonna be tall and they may even be big, but they're going to be weak because they're too tall and they may blow over or fall over because they've had to force their way up. Um, they're also more likely to be root bound. So you've got a strong set of roots that are now weakening because they're root bound and you've got a weak plant. Yeah, so you wanna, that's the first thing you wanna check. Speaking of roots, you wanna look at them. Now you should be able to remove roots easily from your containers. Hold that thought. I'm gonna pick this specific plant to do because I know for a fact that it's going to be root bound. Um, I'm going to stop the share right now and I just wanna show you this. So this plant is one of the plants I used in my containers. Now, when I turn this upside down, it should come out. Now you see that it's not coming out. Even when I'm shaking it, it's not coming out. That means that that plant is most likely root bound. So I'm gonna squeeze the container and hopefully 
that is going to give it exactly what I wanted to have happen. Now we'll get into this a little bit later, but you can see the roots veining through. That is the root ball. This is root, root bound, you can call it, but it's not to the point that it's going to compromise the plant. As you can see, the plant is still very green, very healthy. So you wanna keep that in mind when you're going over the plant, okay? So the white fibrous growth I showed to you and um, you want to make sure there's no brown roots. There were no brown roots on the plant that I just showed you. The plant that I just showed you had white fibers growth. That is what you want to look for. Brown roots means that the plant is most likely uh, going to suffer problems because brown roots on a plant like that means that the roots are dead. Now, of course, if you have a bush or a tree, you're gonna have brown roots because the roots are brown. I'm talking specifically about herbaceous plants. You wanna check the foliage. Leaves should be a consistent, strong color, just like I showed you in that plant. Usually green, but not always. They can be a light color. You just wanna make sure that the color the plant is supposed to be is the color that the leaves are. You want a healthy, vibrant color. No yellowing leaves. You know, you don't want the leaves falling off unless you're, you know, one of those people that likes to save the, all the dead plants over in the basement, bargain basement section of the nursery. But if you're buying plants in general, you want to make sure that it's a green, healthy growth or a vibrant, I should say, a vibrant, healthy growth. Read the label. The plant has an adult size. These plants that I have behind me are definitely going to grow a lot more. And you also want to look at the recommended spacing. Um, you know, recommended spacing is so that you have a healthy plant. Now, if you're the type of person that likes to stuff your containers full, you can do that. But remember, you're going to have to start taking plants out because you can't possibly, you know, put all these little baby plants in there and then expect that they'll be able to survive as adults. Soil moisture. If the potting mix in the plant that you are purchasing is too wet or too dry, the seedlings may be stressed. Just moist is ideal. Now, if you go in and it is too wet, ask. Ask if they've just recently watered the plants or has it been sitting there like that for a couple of days. If it's too dry, then you're probably going to have a problem. Um, clean potting mix very important. You want to, I tend to avoid pots with moss or algae growing on the surface. And you can tell it's that green growth on the surface. Um, it's a sure clue that you are getting an older plant, meaning that it's been sitting there for a while. Now, okay, so I want brandywine tomatoes and I'm looking and all of them have that growth on them. Um, you have to take into consideration that possibly, you know, if they were put out in the beginning of May and it's the beginning of June, so they have been sitting there for about a month, number one. So what you wanna do is just scrape down, scrape some of that algae or that moss off and make sure that the soil underneath looks healthy, that it's not fetid, it doesn't have a smell to it, or it's not soggy and just dripping moist. So you want to make sure about that. But it, generally, if they have moss or algae growing on the top and you have another selection, go for the other selection. Ask questions. Try to go, my tip down there on the left, visit a nursery midweek instead of on busy weekends. If you can go during the week to a nursery, you generally have uh, salespeople that are able to spend a little bit more time with you. Don't be afraid to ask questions. There are very few gardeners out there that don't like to talk about gardening. So um, I have rarely run into somebody that's working in a nursery that doesn't want to answer my questions. And I ask all the time. I've been there and I've seen a lot of people from my workshops that, you know, they're asking questions. I had one lady come up to me and start asking me the questions because she was in one of my workshops a few years ago. Um, ask questions. And when you're asking questions, make sure 
that you or try to make sure that you're asking from a knowledgeable person, not, you know, somebody that was moved over from flooring and woodwork to the garden center. Um, make sure that the answers you're getting make sense to you. And if they don't, Google it. Google is your friend. If you don't want to trust Google or you're not sure of what the answers are, you can call our garden line. That is at the end of this presentation. Or you can um, ask an expert. When you put a question in to ask an expert, it's answered by a master gardener or a um, horticultural professional from one of the universities. So ask, ask, ask questions. The other thing you want to check for, we call them hitchhikers, and they are generally lurking on the underside of the leaves. So you do want to check underneath the leaves to see if there's any aphids or bugs under there. Um, you don't want to be bringing, you know, them home with and mixing them in with your healthy plants. The other thing I will warn you about, when you do bring plants home, don't immediately put them with your healthy plants, especially if you're bringing something home to be a house plant. Keep them outside for a little bit. Make sure that you've cleaned them off. You want to spray use a spray bottle, spray them all off, or use a hose. Make sure that they're clean and they do not have any hitchhikers or else you're going to infest your other plants. <clears throat> Excuse me. This takes us to drainage. Drainage is a huge issue for me because I have lost plants because I have not made sure that my drainage was properly done. Um, I tell a story about my banana tree, which was growing wonderfully and the leaves started turning yellow. So I watered it. Yellow plant needs water. And the leaves were still turning yellow and I wasn't sure what was going on. And I was like, oh, well, it'll clear up. And lo and behold, I, I was literally watching it when it did what I just described about the seeds. The tree just boom, fell over. And when I went to look at it, it pulled right out of the pot and the few roots that were hanging there were uh, old and rotted and that horrible smell was coming out of the soil. There was way too much water in there. What had happened was one of the pieces of crockery that I put in the bottom had blocked the hole and the water just sat in the bottom and it never did drain. So I killed my own plant. Having said that, broken crockery or the pebbles that we all put or used to put in the bottom of our pots, uh, it basically does nothing to improve drainage. Sure, the water is going to drain off, but you're going to have problems with, you have the pebbles on the ground and the roots grow down into them. The minute the roots hit that air, they die. Roots don't like air. So what I do is I use drywall tape. And the reason I use drywall tape is that is a nylon mesh. I use that to cover the drainage hole in the bottom of my pot. It holds the soil back and it allows the moisture to come through. Ever since I started using it, I have not had a problem with drainage on my pots. And I like to tell people, this is my roll of um, drywall tape, okay? This is the same role that I have had since I became a master gardener. They usually start out, they're about this big. And the reason being is this stuff is indestructible. Unless you pull it apart, like really, really, really try to pull it apart, it does not deteriorate. So when you're cleaning your pots, if you just go ahead and um, clean the nylon mesh, you can just put it aside and you can use it again and again and again. Just make sure you clean it well, that's all. Um, you can also use things like coffee filters, uh, newspapers, uh, screening, and you see underneath there on the bottom right, screening may rust. You have to be careful if you are using screening, you need to make sure that you get a nylon screening and don't use a metal screening. If you use a metal screening, it's going to rust. That rust is going to run out the bottom and it's going to stain whatever that pot is sitting on top of. Potting mix. Remember, it's not dirt, it's soil. Soil is an organic medium that we use to grow 
plants. Dirt is the stuff you sweep up off the floor. Soil has organic materials in it, minerals. Uh, it helps the plant grow. Dirt, you don't know what it is. So don't just go out in the backyard and dig and pop some dirt in there. You don't want to use soil from outside anyway because you need a lighter mix. A good potting mix has additives in it like vermiculite, perlite. Some of them use pumice, um, but it's fluffy. It's light, it's fluffy, it's airy. Um, I have it here. So you want to make sure that you are using a nice light mix as opposed to, you know, the clay soil that most of us have. So just make sure that you are using a potting mix or a potting soil. And before I go to that, when you use a potting mix, it will tell you in, on the bag, it will tell you the ingredients right down there on the bottom. You're not gonna be able to see them. I'm just showing you on the bag where they are. It's on the back on the bottom someplace, okay? And the reason I'm pointing that out to you is because a lot of potting soils or potting mixes, if they are the inexpensive ones, then they are going to most likely have some kind of a petrochemical in them. That's why when you use a cheaper potting mix, you get that smell. It's that oily, disgusting smell that comes off of it. Um, that's because they're adding petrochemicals into it. So you want to make sure, especially if you're going to be using it to plant your vegetables or your herbs, you want to make sure that you're using a reputable potting mix. You also want to change that out. The recommendation is you change it out every year. Now, I will admit, I let mine go for maybe two years. If it's something that I will be ingesting, that I am eating, I absolutely change it out every year. And by changing it out, I mean you're going to take it and you're going to use it in your garden um you know you can shore up certain areas you can even use it to plant some grass seed on if you have some bare spots do that if you're growing ornamental flowers you can usually get away with using it a second year but you are going to have to feed those plants because the nutrients in that potting mix are probably used up the recommendation is to change it out once a year Types of plants. So <clears throat> I equate building a container to building a house. The structure is the pot, the foundation is the soil, and the plumbing is the drainage. So who's going to be living in your container? You need to choose plants with similar cultural requirements. What that means is, do they all need the same type of water slash moisture? Do they all need the same type of light? Are they all going to want the same temperature? That's what heat means. The same type of food. Some plants are heavy feeders, which means they need a lot of food. Some, excuse me, some plants are not. So you need to be careful with that. When you're planting them, you're going to water the plants before transplanting. It helps hold the root ball together. I showed you how I flip the pot over, tap gently on the bottom, it should come out. If it doesn't, you can run around the outside of it with some type of a knife or sharp object, and generally they will pop out. Do not pull them or yank them out. You will hurt the plant. You will pull the plant away from the roots. Don't do that. Check the root ball. If, like on my plant, it is root bound, you want to lightly score it. And when I when live TV, folks, when I say lightly score it, uh, what I mean is you're going to take the plant, okay? You're going to take a sharp object and you're going to cut down the side of it, making sure that you've now got a hole about an eighth of an inch into the plant. And you can see, hopefully, that there are roots hanging down. You want to do that in quarters, north, south, east, west. Think of it that way. You want to definitely do that on at least four spots. 
And after you do that, the roots that are on the bottom, lightly tease them out, okay? You want to have roots hanging down when you do that. The reason being is <clears throat> if you just take your plant out and pop it into a container, hang on, I'm stepping away for a second. Just wanted to get something to wipe my hands off. If you are just popping it into a container without doing that, your roots are growing in a circle, okay? And they're called, that's called girdling. And they're going to grow into themselves. The reason you want to cut it is so now the roots know that they can grow out. Well, they don't know, but they will grow out and they'll grow out into that soil. It's the same thing for planting things like trees and bushes. Um, I always talk about, you know, sometimes you watch on TV and you see where they dig a hole this big to put a plant in that's that big. I made it a little bit smaller, okay? And they drop the tree in and they put the soil on top. And I've always wanted to go back and take a look at what that landscaping looks like in six months, because a lot of those trees are going to have problems or a lot of those bushes are going to have problems. Those roots grow into each other. So you wanna make sure even with trees and bushes, but plants especially, that the root ball has been lightly scored and the roots are able to grow out. Put enough soil in the bottom of the container, uh, enough so that the root ball is about an inch below the top of the pot, <clears throat> and put the plant, I say put the plant in the middle of the container and fill with firmly packed soil to eliminate air pockets. Now, that depends on what you're doing with your container. If you're planting it with many plants, and I say that because this container back here is planted with many plants. Okay, so you can see this plant, this container has about seven plants in it, okay? And I have it planted in a specific way because those two containers behind me are gonna go out in front of my garage on either side. So they're gonna be up against a wall. So I put, when you plant, I'm getting ahead of myself. When you plant a container, the, the catchy phrase is you use a thriller, which means it's a big plant. You use a spiller, which means it's spilling over the front of your pot. And you use a filler. It's little plants that go to cover the soil that's left in the pot. When you do it like that, you wanna think about where you're putting your pot. Now my pots, those two pots specifically, are going to go up against a wall. So you're gonna have your thriller towards the back, your spillers, of course, in the front, coming down and spilling over, and then your fillers will just go in front of that thriller plant. So when you do that, you wanna plan it out and you wanna make sure that you know how you're planting it. But getting back to what we were talking about, if you are going to do your container, you want to put it in place where you think you want it to go. And you are going to then fill it with soil. And when I say firmly pack, I don't mean press it down really hard. I mean firmly pushing it down to make sure that you don't have to add any more soil and to make sure you've gotten rid of all the air bubbles that may be in that soil. Typically, after you're done, you do an initial watering from the top or put the pot, depending on the size, in a container of water to soak up the, the water that's in there, okay? Just make sure you water it. Um, depending on the size of the plants that you've used. Now, you just saw my container is very full of plants. You may have to repot during the season. And that is what I do. I will pull plants out of that and I will put them someplace else because now it's getting too much for that pot. Some of those plants in there, I can divide and I can put them in other containers. 
which is why I said earlier, I run into a problem of having way too many containers. Um, you also wanna keep a careful eye on the weather. May 15th is our local last frost date. Sometimes we get plants that we're putting in containers and it gets much too cold for the plants that we're choosing and we will lose the plants. So know that um, the FDA says our local last frost date, that is an average for Newcastle County, is May 15th. You can go online and you can check that for your area if you're not in the Newcastle County area. Kent County is a little bit earlier and Sussex is even earlier than that. Pennsylvania is a little bit later. It just depends on where you are. You move towards coastal New Jersey, and again, it gets back towards the 15th. You just wanna check on that so that you're not freezing your plants. Um, there are a lot of plants that we use in containers that won't necessarily enjoy the cold weather. Containers require frequent, frequent watering. I cannot stress that enough, that when you have containers, you have to make sure that they're watered. In the spring, you can get away with doing it usually in the mornings once a day. As we go into the high summer, you're probably gonna have to water at least two, possibly three times a day, depending on how much water your plants drink up. If you're putting something like a tomato plant in a container, you're definitely going to have to water it a lot. Tomatoes need constant water or you get cracked tomatoes. So you have to be careful about that. Don't let the containers sit in the water. It has to be able to drain, as I explained before, with drainage. You want to check often to make sure the container is draining, in fact, that it's not just sitting there like my poor little banana tree. You wanna water the container to the point of runoff where you see the water coming out the bottom, and you wanna make sure that there is water coming out the bottom so that you make sure that the container is draining. Mulching, yes, you should mulch your containers. Um, Five reasons to use mulch in a container or in the garden. Fewer weeds, improved soil, the, the mulch breaks down and adds nutrients. Um, it makes for cooler soil, especially during the summer. And it insulates from heat and cold. Not so much in the spring with the cold because you don't wanna be planting too early. But as you go into autumn, we get those really cool nights and those really nice warm days. So you want to make sure that you're insulating your plants' roots to help them survive. And of course, mulch retains moisture. So that is a huge benefit from mulching. You can use organic garden mulch. You can use a hardwood mulch, the same as you put out in your gardens. If you use you know, a hardwood mulch, just make sure that it's the shredded so that it does fit in between your plants as opposed to the big pine nuggets. Um, pine, I mean, cedar is always recommended by uh, nursery industries because it is good for keeping away insects. Remember, if you're using cedar, that you could possibly be keeping away the beneficial insects. So weigh that. I tend to use pine in my containers so that I don't run into that problem. Um, cocoa mulch, keep in mind that cocoa mulch contains a chemical, theobromine, that can be harmful to pets. It's the same chemical that is in chocolate. And we all know, and if you don't, now you will, that chocolate is bad for dogs or cats in large quantities because it will make them sick. Some people use hay or straw. The thing you have to watch out with is that if you are using hay, hay contains hay seed and it might start sprouting in your container. Either way, hay or straw, the birds like to use that for nesting. So that could be a reason that it's always messed up because the birds are coming down there to steal it for their nests. Because I'm talking about mulch, I'm just gonna cover mulch volcanoes real quick. I call them in a container, I call them container volcanoes. Go easy on the mulch, don't overdo it. Use the proper technique for mulching, which is you mulch to a layer of 
you know, about two inches. In containers, it might be less because you don't have that much space and the plants are smaller. But you want to make sure that you're not crowding up against the stems because if you do get little insects or you happen to get a mouse or something that's in there, the mouse doesn't know and he's chewing through the mulch and he goes right up to the, the stem and he chews right through it and you've just, um, you've just lost your plant. Death by mulch. I don't know if you've ever seen a mulch volcano, but what that is, is when you have a tree, a lot of times people pile the mulch up on the tree. So it looks like one of the first five pictures. That is incorrect way to mulch your tree. The bottom right is the correct way to mulch your tree. Okay. So I just throw this in there so that you're all aware of what the term mulch volcano means and why we do stress that when you mulch, you mulch correctly. If you're packing it up like that mulch volcano, what you're doing is you're not allowing the roots to breathe on your tree. And you're also giving the tree the signal to grow roots higher up. So when it starts growing the roots out of there, now it's causing, it's compromising the tree. And you can go online and research mulch volcanoes and you can see what it does to a tree. With a container, you don't want to over mulch because you're just going to have it spilling out and you're going to have it, you know, clamping off the plants. So you just want to be careful. If you're not sure how to mulch, please go online and look up proper mulching techniques. Give us a call on the garden line or ask an expert. Keeping your containers fresh. You can change your containers out with the seasons. Some plants have a specific bloom time. Once the bloom is passed, you could pull them out of there and you could put a new plant in. You can use the same container that you've used for summer plants and just start putting your mums or your asters in there for the fall. What I do is I have a lot of containers and I will do containers for spring. And then I'll start buying my summer plants and I'll do my containers and I'll leave them on the back deck. And when it's time to change them out, I take my spring plants, I put them aside, and I pull out my summer containers. I break down my spring containers, clean them out, and I plant my fall flowers so that those containers are ready to go back out in the fall. And now I've kept my containers fresh so that I have interest for spring, summer, and fall. And lately I've been getting into the winter interest containers where you use uh, twigs and branches and greenery and berries. And unfortunately, I don't have pictures of them right now because I just did it for the first time this year. You know, we were all looking for things to do with COVID. So that was my big thing this year and they came out pretty good. So you can have containers all year round. So we are back to questions. So does anybody have any questions? Uh, yes, JW, we have quite a few. So the first one comes from Catherine. What about cheesecloth for drainage holes at the bottom of the pot? Sure, absolutely. Okay, uh, the next question comes from Nancy. She sees some recommendations to use styrofoam peanuts in the larger pots to help with weight and drainage. Is that a good idea? Uh, they work, absolutely. Um, I tend to use other things besides styrofoam because no matter what, you're eventually going to have to get rid of that styrofoam and styrofoam is not recyclable. It does go into the landfill. So if you happen to have the packing peanuts around and you want to get another use out of them, yes, use them. Don't go out and specifically buy styrofoam packing peanuts to use as filler for your pots. If you have large containers, you can do a couple of things. <clears throat> One of the things I recommend is if you have gum trees or any type of a tree that puts out, uh, trying to get this so you can see it, that puts out, uh, they call them gumballs or monkey balls. You can use those in the bottom of your pot. And if you have as many as I have, it fills up the pot quite nicely. And they're also light. So the pot's still light, so you can move it around. 
And the reason I recommend those is because they're biodegradable. After you're done for the season, you can throw them in your compost bin or you can throw them out in the woods. You know, I have woods behind my house that I use for stuff like that. So if you can use something else, I recommend it. You can also take a large pot. Uh, I don't have two pots here. So if I had another pot, I had a big pot, I can take a smaller pot and just drop it down. And now you've got all that space on top and it's filling up that large pot. So there's a couple of ways to do it, but you can absolutely do it. Okay, the next question comes from Karen. In terms of feeding plants, can we use comp-free water? If so, how do you make it? And do you need to dilute it before pouring it into the pot? Uh, I just want to make sure I understood the question. Comfrey, as in C-O-M-F-R-E-Y? Correct. Okay. Yes, you can. Um, it does not need to be diluted. Um, comfrey is awesome to put in uh, compost because it's a high nitrogen content and it tends to break down compost a lot quicker. If you're going to use comfrey, a couple of things you want to be careful with. You do not want to get the seeds, so don't use the flowers. You'll use the leaves and you make a tea out of it. And then you just use the tea to water the plant. I would not water all the time with comfrey. It's kind of the same thing as over fertilizing. You can over comfrey <laughs> your plant. Um, I think a better thing to water your plants with is probably compost tea. Um, and you can look up how to make compost tea online. Okay, thank you. The next one comes from IS2. How do you keep green and black algae from growing on the exterior of white ceramic containers without killing the plants? Um, I don't really have a good answer for that. Basically, you just have to clean it off. It's a manual clean. Um, you can use vinegar on the outside of the pot. Just make sure it doesn't get into the pot because if you do, it works as an herbicide. So I would just, you know, wipe it off and just make sure you're cleaning your pots once a year. Um, I do want to interject here. I do see something in the chat. Styrofoam recycling, whoops, is also at the DSWA location in Newark on Corporate Boulevard. I was just there last week and saw the collection container. Yes, it is. But once you've used the styrofoam in the bottom of your pots, they're dirty. And DSWA frowns on you. <laughs> and if they see you, will stop you from putting your styrofoam in there if it's got dirt on it, on soil. Um, so again, you're using those peanuts in the bottom of a pot and you are, um, you're putting soil on top of them. So they are gonna get dirty. And that kind of negates the whole styrofoam recycling thing. It's, uh, I forgot what the recycling place calls it, but you basically break the recycling process because there's other things in with the styrofoam that shouldn't be in with the styrofoam. So, uh, so next question. Um, could you please repeat the source of the accurate frost date, first frost data info? Um, that came from Phoebe. Okay, Phoebe, um, for Newcastle County, it is May 15th. That is our average last frost date, okay? You can get specifics uh, if you go to um, the Federal Agriculture site. You can just look up, um, you can Google last frost date for my area, and you'll get a lot of responses. Um, if you live in another area, I would recommend Googling it and getting the last average frost date. Now remember, that's an average date. It can be later, it can be earlier. Um, you just have to get the one for your area and then you just have to watch the weather. Okay, the next question comes from Anne. Do you have any thoughts on Oyas or Olas, the terracotta vessels that are planted underground to slowly release water to neighboring plants? I think that they work well in a small area application. If you're going to use them for a, you're talking about plant, putting them underground. 
So that makes me think you're talking about a larger garden as opposed to a container. In containers, they do work well. In large areas in your yard, you have to have a lot of them. So if you're using them as you should, yes, I agree with that and they work well. Okay, um, we have a question from Rick about issues with squirrels digging in the containers. <laughs> this one always comes up. So <clears throat> um, something you can do, depending on what you wanna do, because you may not like what this looks like, but you can take forks, plastic forks, and you can stick them in your containers so that the tines are sticking out. So here's the handle of the fork. Here's the fork itself. Stick it in like this. Squirrels don't like to be poked. And the minute they're poked, they think that something's wrong and they don't come. That's what I do for my strawberries and my apple trees. I have apple trees in containers. And since I've started doing that, I have not had a problem. Now in my larger containers, because I also have two apple trees in very large round containers, what I've done is I've laid down chicken wire as a mat and then I put the mulch on top. And the minute the squirrels start to dig in the mulch, they hit the chicken wire and they don't know what's going on. So they will leave the containers alone. You can also do, um, uh, I do not have the formula for it, but you can just pretty much mix Tabasco sauce and water. And it's, um, it's probably like a one to four ratio, I would say. Put it in a spray bottle and spray the soil in your containers. And the minute the squirrels start digging and they touch themselves, they will get that stinging sensation and they'll know not to dig there again. And don't worry, it doesn't permanently harm them. It's just a deterrent. Uh, you can also use any number of, um, you know, things that they sell at the nurseries or the big box stores as a squirrel deterrent. It's just, I found that the squirrel deterrents don't work as well. Something else that you can do to try to keep um, uh, squirrels out of your containers is if you have a pet and you brush your pet on a regular basis, take the hair and uh, put it in like a little, like a little baggie, like some kind of a nylon bag or, or something that the scent can come out. And if you put that around your containers, they smell that animal and they stay away from it. Um, what I do is I take my cat's hairs and I put it around the actual plant and you can't really see it because of the foliage. So I don't even use a baggie or, or a bag, I should say. And again, I don't really have problems with squirrels and I live in a very high squirrel area. <laughs> okay, uh, the next question comes from Peggy as it pertains to you talking about uh, you tried winter containers this, for the first time this year. Um, could you do a workshop on how you did those winter containers? And the second part to her question is, can you plant dahlias in a large container? Okay, first part, good suggestion. Um, that is something that I will work on. As you can see, I am writing that down. Uh, that could, a winter container workshop could also go along with like winter decorating. So that might be something I can work on with another master gardener. We can do like reeds or, uh, somebody had suggested to me that we do um, a presentation on crafts with herbs because I gave an herbs workshop a few weeks ago. Um, so that is something I was considering and uh, winter containers could do very well with something like that. So thank you for the suggestion. And the second part of the question was... Can you plant dahlias? Dahlias, yes, water? absolutely. Um, of course... Uh, if you're going to put dahlias in a container, I personally would probably look for, they do have dwarf dahlias. I would look for those unless you do want the height. But remember, if you are going to have just a regular size dahlia, you're probably going to need to stake it or else it's going to fall over. 
but yep, you can do that. Okay, next question comes from Vera. Is there a resource that will tell us what plants have deep roots and what plants have shallow roots so you can choose the right pot or mix and the plants can get better or can share the space better? I guess that's something that you could probably Google for root depth. I do know that we have several, or not we, I do know that there are several great charts online for native plants and their comparison to non-native plants as far as their root depth. One thing about native plants is they tend to go down a little bit deeper and they tend to help break up the clay soil a lot better because they've, you know, they've developed in this area. So they're used to growing through um, clay soils. Um, but you could definitely Google that. I don't know of a specific resource for root size. Okay, the next question comes from Lisa. Uh, do you have a recommendation on the best potting mixes? She has seen one that's uh, lobster soil and compost. I'm not familiar with what lobster soil is. Um, if I were to guess, I would say it's probably got their shells crushed up in it. Um, but again, I'm, I'm not familiar with it. So that's something that I would have to Google. If you'd like, you can send me an email about that question and I can research it for you and get back to you. That's a possibility. Okay. Um, the next question comes from Amea. Uh, can you also use empty water bottles in the bottom of a large pot for drainage? Sure, a lot of people do that. Um, I would probably keep the caps on just so that the inside of the bottle doesn't get dirty. And then before you recycle them, uh, you're going to need to rinse them off um, because that goes back to the whole thing with the styrofoam as far as the soil getting on to the water bottles and um, that can mess up the recycling process. But yeah, you can use them. Okay. Uh, next question comes from Tegan. Uh, if you have ants in the soil around your plant, what can you do to get rid of them without killing the plant? Um, I would do baking soda around. I would go out away from the plant and I would put baking soda around. Ants don't like baking soda. So if they, you know, it breaks their chemical trails. So if that is something that you can do or feel comfortable with doing, um, you just have to use it sparingly because if you use enough baking soda, you're going to affect the pH in the soil around your plant. Uh, other than that, um, the only other thing you can do is go to, you know, a commercial product. Okay. Uh, Ramesh asks, can we keep the mowed grass as a fertilizer in raised beds? Okay, so that would go to the same thing as using mowed grass in your compost bin. <clears throat> You have to make sure that your mowed grass doesn't have any treatments on it, like uh, some type of an herbicide. I'd be careful even if you used a fertilizer, because a lot of fertilizers have, for grass, have an herbicide in them. Um, you can't really use it as a mulch because it'll pack down and it kind of, then the water kind of runs off of it instead of into it. And the other thing is grass at the beginning needs assistance to break down. You need to mix brown into it or else you're going to get a, a really strange funky smell because it's gone anaerobic as, a, as opposed to aerobic, meaning there's no oxygen in there to break it down as opposed to the oxygen it does need. And that's why you get the smell. So I would say using freshly cut grass to mulch is something you wanna stay away from. Use, if you're going to take the grass off, I would put it in the compost bin and then use compost to mulch your containers or your plants. 
Okay, um, the next one comes from Yang. Can I plant mint around my petunias in a hanging basket to deter deer from eating the flowers? Sure. Uh, mint is great in containers. As a matter of fact, I recommend mint be grown in containers because if you just plant it in the ground, it tends to take over. But yep, you can absolutely do that. Okay, um, the next one comes from IS2. A toad likes to jump into our six inch high porch container during the night mm -hmm. and cover themselves with soil. They disturb the plants, but we do like them because they eat the large bugs. Any ideas on keeping them versus discouraging the toads? Uh, so I'm thinking the question is that you want to keep the toads, but you'd prefer they didn't mess with your containers. The reason they're going into the container and burrowing into the top layer of soil is because of the moisture. Toads like moisture. So I would recommend building a little area for the toads. And I know that sounds really strange, but if you take a clay pot and you like a broken one and you have a little hole in it, I put a pile of mulch there, make sure that it's wet and put the, the clay pot on top and build a little toad house. Um, my grandmother was one for decoys or um, she didn't call them decoys. I forget the words she used, but she She'd always try to figure out a way to attract the animal to where she didn't want it to be, such as her vegetable garden. She would plant uh, hostas over on the other side of the yard because deer love hostas. And they'd eat the heck out of the hostas and leave her vegetables alone. Uh, she also grew persimmon trees. The reason being the persimmons would fall to the ground and not persimmons, <laughs> pawpaws. Uh, she would let the pawpaws stay there and the animals would go over to the pawpaws and then her garden would be left alone. So it's, it's more a case of attract them to where you, attract them away from where you don't want them to be. So a toad house. Okay, um, we have a question from Kelly. Would the squirrel deterrence also work for rabbits? Uh, yeah, they should. The um, cayenne pepper spray absolutely would. Um, the forks, I would, I'd have to say that we have rabbits and I don't see the rabbits in my container, so they must be working. <laughs> I don't know specifically, but rabbits don't like to be poked either. Okay. Um, we have a question from Claire about the advantages and disadvantages of clay, ceramic, and plastic pots and which ones you use. So the question would be, does your handout have that information in it? It does. Okay. Um, Lisa is asking, do you have a recommended potting soil? And what do you think about the moisture control soils? Uh, we really can't recommend a specific brand of potting soil. I tend to go with the tried and true potting soils. Um, I stay away from inexpensive potting soils because I look at my plants as an investment and I don't want them, I want them to perform as best as they can. Uh, the moisture controlled ones they're awesome. They help cut down on the amount of moisture that you want to use, or that you have to use. Um, you just have to, you know, like anything, you have to know what is in the soil and how to use that to your benefit, such as, okay, so they have the moisture crystals in them. So does that mean that you cut back on watering? Like I can think of two specific um, examples where you are supposed to, with the one soil, you are supposed to water and then the little uh, things that are in there for moisture puff up and you're not supposed to water again until they start decreasing in size. And then the other one, I don't see any change to the crystals that they have in there, but I have to make sure that I'm not watering as frequently as my plants that don't have the crystals because 
I don't want the ones with the crystals to get soggy and, you know, like a bog. So you have to be careful of that. Just if you're using the moisture crystals, make sure that you're watering correctly for the moisture crystals. But yes, they're, they're you know, I'm a big one for science. So they're scientifically proven. <laughs> Okay, um, Mark is asking, do you have any advice on slugs? Um, I do the old pie plate with beer. What you do is you dig a shallow hole so that um, you make like a little pond with a pie plate, like an aluminum pie plate, and you fill it with cheap beer. Don't use a good beer. Um, and the slugs basically go in there because they love the beer. And then the next morning you have a tray full of slugs that have died a happy death. It's <laughs> a great idea. Um, Claire... you can also, I'm sorry. You can also use diatomation, diatomaceous earth or crushed seashells or crushed eggshells. Um, slugs do not like that, that cutting thing on their skin. So if you want to sprinkle that around, that, that will keep them away from your plants. Okay. Uh, Claire is asking if you can grow sweet potatoes all year round, like if you were to use a grow bag and bring it inside for the winter and use a grow light. Um, I have never done that. So I would love to hear back if she does it and to know if it's a thing that you can do. You just have to be careful when you're doing something like that, um, that you have them growing outside in a bag and then you bring that bag into the house. So you're not 100% sure what else is in that bag when you bring it in. Um, just be careful of that, okay? Uh, so if you're going to experiment, I would say if you're going to experiment in that way, what you should do is start your sweet potatoes late. Like you have your outside sweet potatoes. Take one of your sweet potatoes and start it like in August. Um, I'm not sure how you do your starts for sweet potatoes, but I just take the potato and I soak it in water and I let the vines start growing and then I clip the vines off and then I let the roots grow. Then I would plant those into a, a new bag with fresh soil and then I would try to grow that in the house as opposed to bringing a bag into the house. Because I'm not trying to give you horror stories but um, I had a bag, I had several bags of garden soil and they were out in the backyard and I was going to go over to my aunt's house and do some work for her over there. And I was putting the bags of garden soil into the car. And as I was doing it, I noticed a black snake come back over by the garden soil and I didn't see where he went. So I stopped immediately because if I couldn't find the snake, I knew with my luck, I knew where the snake went and it turned out that yes that snake did go into the bag of the garden soil and when i opened it up and he slithered or sh i should say she slithered away there were snake eggs in the garden soil so this was a plastic bag of garden soil that somehow the snake got into laid its eggs if i had brought that bag into the house into the warm house in the middle of winter, I'm going to throw off the timing of those hatchlings. And they're most likely going to hatch inside my house. And I don't think I need to draw any more pictures. <laughs> so I would be really careful about bringing a bag, a grow bag that's been outside all summer into the house. That's my only caution. Other than that, I think it's a great idea. Okay, uh, Beth would like to make a recommendation for a future workshop for overwintering cannas and dahlias because she's not had much luck with that. The roots often rot. Uh, 
and cannas. I have had that problem in the past and it sounds like either she's storing them in something that is too wet or they're not being dried properly before they're brought inside. So the best way to do both cannas and dahlias is to let them dry out, not to the point of being witheringly dry, but they need to dry out slightly and then store them in a dark place in sand or sawdust. Um, if she wants a more comprehensive answer to that, tell her to send me an email, themastergardener at comcast.net. Um, Ann Boyd is our resident expert on dahlias, and I can find out how she would answer that question. Because she really is, she grows some of the most beautiful dahlias you've ever wanted to see. And she, I know for a fact, she stores them over winter every year. Thank you. Um, the next question we have is from Stephanie. Would you recommend introducing ladybugs as opposed to an insect re soap re uh, repellent spray to get rid of any pests? I'm going to quote Dr. Brian Kunkel on this one. And he is our resident IPM uh, expert from uh, the University of Delaware. He said, if you are buying ladybugs, you are basically throwing your money away because the ladybugs are not going to stay in your garden, but your neighbors will probably thank you. And that's pretty much what he has told us in reference to ladybugs. I have never bought them, so I do not know specifically how they would work, but there are other methods to insect control rather than ladybugs. So it's not something I personally recommend. That does not mean that it is not recommended. It means it's not something I would personally recommend. JW, this is Carrie. I think um, you answered that eloquently. I would just add that if you have an enclosed environment, oh, okay. if you have a greenhouse, for example, they're an excellent addition to an integrated pest management. But like JW said, not in an environment where they can scatter off, but in an enclosed environment, environment absolutely. Thanks, Carrie. Sure. Okay, the next question comes from Andrea. Uh, she grew tulips in clay containers this past spring. Can she regrow them in a pot again, or does she need to plant them in the ground until fall? Um, tulips. Tulips are a tough one because they, if you're going to grow them in a container and you want them to grow in that same container again, you have to remember that tulips grow from their bulbs and when their greenery is up they are storing more energy not only for the bloom the following year but to create more bulbs so if she's got them in a container and they create more bulbs they're probably going to crowd themselves out and she's probably going to lose a lot of tulips that were in that container so I would recommend that if that's what she wants to do, I would split her tulips into two separate containers. And then she has to treat them like any other plant. She has to make sure they're watered. She has to make sure that the greenery stays alive long enough for those bulbs to store energy and, um, and create the blooms for the following year. So I personally do not grow tulips. I, I have grown tulips in containers. I do not keep them in containers past one year. I then put them outside and I plant them outside. So if she's willing to do a little bit of work and uh, like I said, divide them, then they'll probably do fine. But uh, it, it, it's a bit of work. They're picky. <laughs> Okay, the next question comes from VJ. Um, if you plant seeds in starter pots or on wet paper towels, will that expedite the seedling process or will planting them directly in the soil in a pot be just as good? 
it really depends on the seed that you're going to do that to. Some seeds require a specific depth of soil to be on top of them to germinate. Other seeds will germinate like in a paper towel or lightly sprinkled on top of the soil or with an eighth of an inch of soil on top of them. So it's really up to the seed itself and what type of plant you're trying to grow. So I, I can't give a general answer because there's too many variables there. But you can do it with some seeds, yes. Okay, uh, Yang is asking, how do you get rid of aphids? <laughs> um, there's commercial products you can buy for aphids. You can plant things to attract um, beneficial bugs to your containers. If there are containers on the inside of the house, then um, like your house plants or something like that, then that's a mechanical process where you need to use a little bit of, um, I would use a mild dish detergent and water, and you're going to have to clean the entire plant off. At the end of the season, when I bring a lot of my containers in, one of the things that I do is use um, a mild dish detergent and I basically clean off the leaves on every plant that I'm bringing into the house uh, if I know that they attract aphids like basil. Uh, I clean that off. Uh, my hibiscus. I have had a uh, hibiscus tree for, oh gosh, since I lived in Atlanta, which was 1996. And that is a magnet for aphids. And I have to clean that tree off every year before I bring it into the house or they get all over the place. So commercial product or just uh, manual labor. Okay, uh, DPH is asked saying that they have a lot of gnats around their seedlings. Does that mean that their moisture or soil is, their soil has too much moisture or is too wet? It could mean that. It could also be that gnats tend to thrive on decaying plant matter. So if you have like leaves that are dying and falling off, you need to make sure that you get rid of them. There should be no debris on the top of your soil. Um, now you're talking about seedlings. Um, yeah, okay, so we're talking about seedlings. So the moisture is definitely a problem. So you probably don't want it to be as moist. Um, the other thing you can do is there are specific um, products that are made for gnats around seedlings. It has to be a mild product because if you use anything that's really strong, you might harm the seedlings. Um, you can, in a regular... Uh, in a regular spray bottle, it doesn't really matter the size, put about five drops of a mild dish detergent and about a teaspoon of oil. I would use olive oil since it's an all, it's a natural oil and put it in warm water, fill the rest of it with warm water in the spray bottle, shake it up really well, and then spray the soil around your plant that recipe was given to us by people who came in to give a workshop or a talk to the master gardeners many, 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 many years ago. And they had an interior landscape design company. And that was the formula that they gave us to deal with um, gnats and the little flies. And I have used that very successfully since they came in. The one thing you wanna keep in mind is you are using oil in there. So make sure the surface that's underneath your seeds isn't gonna be harmed by the oil, okay? Because it is an oil and it's still, even though it's mild, it's still considered to be an herb, uh, uh, insecticide. So it is, you know, it's an insecticide. Make sure you're not going to damage any type of furniture that's underneath, but you can try that. Okay. <laughs> You're welcome. Um, we have a question from Ramesh, uh, who had a strawberry plant, which had 
three flowers on it. It was in a pot filled with garden soil. It died after a week, even though it was watered well. Is there any special care needed for strawberry plants or is it a problem with transferring the plant to a garden soil pot? Okay. Ramesh, when you say garden soil, are you talking soil that you took from your garden? Are you talking a bag of garden soil? Or are you just using garden soil as a description? Okay, so you're specifying that it's a bag of garden soil. I do not recommend using garden soil for containers with plants because garden soil is not, remember I was showing you guys the, the potting soil and I was telling you that it was loose and it was fluffy. You want to use a potting soil as opposed to a garden soil. A garden soil is to be used as an additive to your garden. A potting soil or a potting mix is what I would use for containers. What happened possibly <clears throat> is once the garden soil got wet, it compressed the roots to the point that they couldn't absorb any moisture anymore. So that's why the strawberry plant died. Um, I have 10 pots of strawberry plants outside right now that I had last year. They came back beautifully this year and um, I got some great strawberries off of them. They were planted in potting soil, not garden soil. So I think the problem there was probably the garden soil. Use potting soil. That should help you out. You're very welcome. Okay, I think that's it for the questions, JW. Thank you. You're very welcome, folks. This is your last chance. Any other questions? If you do think of something, as I tend to do afterwards, and you just want to shoot me a question, please remember that my email address is themastergardener at comcast.net. And uh, thank you, Cindy H. Um, it was a pleasure, folks. I'm just sorry I didn't get to see you all in person. For more information about gardening, our Master Gardener workshops, or to become a Master Gardener, visit us here.